Available at audible.com. Northampton House Press presents Down to a Sunless Sea, a Tiller Galloway novel by David Poyer. Narrated by Edison McDaniels. Half a mile into the icy dark, the diver scraped to a stop. He tried an experimental kick and wriggle, then dug his fingers into gritty rock and hauled. He didn't move. Held there, ribs and shoulders squeezed tight by the cave's walls, he realized he was caught. Instead of struggling, he relaxed. Stop, think, evaluate the situation. He clicked his light back on, and by its sudden brilliance pondered the pale pitted stone, dotted with the fossils of ancient scallops and sea biscuits that glowed inches from his eyes. He tasted the sulfurous seep around his mouthpiece and purged a spoonful of murky water from his mask. Then he brought his wrist up, focusing his attention on instruments and gauges. The luminescent numbers said he could breathe for fifty-two more minutes at this depth. The twin steel tanks on his back were cross-connected with dual regulators in case one free floater jammed. He had another regulator and stage tank clipped to a D-ring on his harness. He'd already breathed it down, but that still left it two-thirds full. A fourth, smaller tank held pure oxygen for decompression on the way up after the traverse. Calmed by the knowledge he had plenty to breathe, he concentrated again on the constriction, but no matter how much air he dumped from his buoyancy compensator or how tightly he ground his groin into the smooth stone, he couldn't free his tanks from the ceiling niche into which they'd snapped like a rifle bolt. He was caught, wedged tight as a mouse in a black snake's jaws, trapped under the solid rock, alone, deep in the black labyrinth. He began hyperventilating, sucking in gusts of dry, metallic-tasting air. His heart raced. The beast in his belly was waking. It wanted to tear off the mask and hood, yank the mouthpiece out, and claw its way up to the light. But there was no light above him, and no air. Just thirty to sixty million years worth of Oligocene limestone, and, above that, the muddy, leaf-strewn bed of a river. If he panicked, he was dead. It was that simple. But you don't panic, he told himself. He'd mapped systems in the Yucatan ten times longer than this one. In fifteen years of cave work, he'd blown regulators, lost guidelines, burned out lights, snapped off valves, lost primary gas, had gauges implode and computers fail, even driven his Tecna into a rock wall at full speed once, and survived every time. Staring into the dark, he pulled out a memory he kept for times like this, a fall afternoon, many years before. The smell of burning leaves, his granddad's voice, telling him how much he looked like his dad when his dad was little. The old house. He went inside, and there was the mudroom, then the living room, the moose head, the big record player, and on it his father's tarnishing tennis trophies. Gradually his heart dropped back into a normal rhythm. His hand stopped twitching. He groped at his chest, found the squeeze tube, and took three quick gulps of Gatorade and honey. He thrust his mouthpiece back in, the rubber mud gritty and foul after the sweet liquid, cleared the regulator, and reconsidered his position. He'd obviously gotten through here before. There was his guideline leading off into the dark. He must have eaten better than he thought over the winter. Amazing what an extra couple of pounds around the middle could do. Well, there was always slack somewhere, as Houdini used to say. He took his primary regulator out again and shifted to the secondary, on the seven-foot hose. Then, wriggling backward as it came forward, he began working his tank harness up over his shoulders. His joints cracked as if they were dislocating, but at last he was rewarded by a hollow clank. The manifold unlocked from the ceiling with a shower of mud and stone fragments. He grabbed for the guideline before it vanished in the murk. He shoved the harness and gear through ahead of him, the tank scraping and clanging like muffled bells, then grabbed an outcrop and pulled himself after them, belly pressing loving tight into the rock. He wriggled twenty feet, the jagged fossils ripping at his hands in suit, before the constriction opened out. Beyond it, his light probed blackness, tracing an oval passage walled with dark stone. He breathed easier, and the beast closed its eyes. 
He checked his valves and slipped the tanks back on, then rested for a minute. He adjusted his buoyancy, centering himself in the six-foot-wide passage, and listened to the silence, the incredible peace. No matter how quiet it was at the surface, if you listened, you always heard something. The rumble of traffic, the distant thunder of an airline. Available at audible.com.